whether thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, or a phantom of night that hath no home, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul, whatever thou be until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink, thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own, into our house enter thou not, through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to Scared to Death, Creeps, Peepers, Roberts, and Annabelles. I'm Dan. And I'm Lindsay. And this is the second to last episode before Halloween. What, what? And speaking of Halloween, you have one Halloweeny announcement, <laughs> and then we're off and running. I do have one Halloweeny announcement. Uh, gang, this is your last call, last chance. Don't <laughs> forget, this week, Thursday, October 24th, 6 p.m. Pacific time. What are we doing? We're all getting together, and we're all watching the live Scared to Death. That's right. That's right. Let's do it together. Okay, you're going to go to moment.co slash scared to death to get your tickets. And don't forget that if you get a ticket, even if you happen to not be able to join us on the day, something comes up, mm-hmm. your kid pukes, you know, Halloween candy all over you, as kids often do, uh, the playback is good for two weeks. So yeah, go ahead. Weeks. Get those tickets, join us live, watch it as many times as you want over the two weeks afterwards. Uh, this is the fourth annual time we're doing this, and we love mm-hmm. it, and we would be honored if you would join us in this tradition. Woohoo! Woohoo! Okay, uh, I have for today's show 10 stories. Two stories. Oh, womp, womp, womp. One of them is very long. Okay. Uh, one of them is normal length. Uh, longer overall content than normal. Okay. How about you? I've got a tight two. Okay. And I'm pretty pumped about both of them. Uh, good, good. My first story takes us out into the woods, which is just always a little bit creepy. Mm-hmm. And then my second story, I it's about a sleepover, and that's about all I can say. It is so odd, and I cannot wait to get your take at the end as to what in the heck you think happened. All right, cool. Uh, my first story is a is a big one, and I don't usually use this adjective on the show, but a, an important story as far as haunted house stories go. It's the story of the haunting of the Fox family home in Hydesville, New York in 1848, and it's the origin story of essentially every haunted house story that has ever come since, at least in most of the Western world. Okay, that's cool. I'll explain that as we get into it. But yeah, but really creepy and packed with a lot of interesting historical horror information. And then for my second story, we'll head west from New York to investigate the claims of the Francis E. Warren Air Force Base, located just outside of Cheyenne, Wyoming. And there we will meet the ghost of an airman named Gus and some other spirits. So okay. Once you show me, uh, well, go ahead. I was going to say that sounds fun. Yes, it should be good time. Uh, once you show me uh, what spoopy socks you're displaying this week, I'll proceed. I've got these fluffy pumpkins. Oh, yeah. Perfect for this time of year. <laughs> I suddenly forgot the word pumpkin. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> that was a they're funny fluffy. Hesitation. Fluffy gourd things. <laughs> I, I know. I was looking at it. I was like, oh, God, it's orange. What are these orange gourds called? And it's it's kind of round. <laughs> <laughs> I hate when my brain does that. Yeah, just a weird little <laughs> glitch. Glitch in the brain matrix. Okay, so here we go. Let's go. Uh, The Fox family home might very well be the most important haunted house in modern human history. And that is not an exaggeration. Uh, For reasons that will become clear in the story, the haunting of the Fox family in 1848 was the origin story, as I mentioned, if you will, of the Victorian spiritualist movement that gave rise in one way or another to essentially every haunted house story uh, that has come since. And probably every one you've ever heard. Uh, If the Fox family had not endured the paranormal horrors that they did, or put on such an elaborate hoax, if you believe the skeptics, if the poltergeist that plagued their New York home had never existed, and if their youngest daughter had never attempted to communicate with it, spiritualism itself might have never came to be, which would have been more detrimental than you might think. Victorian spiritualism was the first time a movement, religious or otherwise, was based solely on regularly communicating with the dead. Humanity had never seen anything quite like it before. Of course, people have been trying to reach out to the dark beyond since time immemorial, but this was different, very different. Communicating with ghosts on the other side was not a part of Victorian spiritualism. Like all the other spiritual and or theological movements throughout history, it was the only part. There were no other tenets or doctrines or commandments or philosophies or gods or rituals or customs. The entire movement was founded on a singular belief that the dead can talk to us and that we can talk back to the dead. And it changed the world. 
Not only did Victorian spiritualism give us seances and Ouija boards and crystal balls, it also led to the creation of the horror novel, which in turn led to the rise of both the fantasy and science fiction genres. So pretty cool. Uh, Additionally, the movement has also had a crucial impact on the development of psychology, psychiatry, phrenology, hypnotherapy, photography, and other ideological movements like vegetarianism, feminism, class equality, anti-vaccination, anti-vivisection, literacy for all, lunacy law reform, and on and on and on. So all in all, Victorian spiritualism was truly monumental, and it started with one ghost. Ready to meet this ghost? Let's go. Uh, Before we do, just one more thing. Uh, Since it took place, this story has been told over and over and over again, and the peripheral details have fluctuated while the core story has remained relatively unchanged. And I bring this up only to say that if you're familiar with this story, the version you are about to hear might not be exactly like the one you've already heard. Uh, The version I'm about to relate to you is the culmination of extensive research into both primary and secondary sources, which is a little bit of character dramatization to make it flow better. Okay, with that out of the way, now we can truly begin. Time now for the tale of Mr. Splitfoot, Can You Hear Me? John Fox, his wife, and their children arrived in Hydesville, New York in December of 1847. At the time, their youngest daughter, Kate, was 12 and her older sister, Margareta, was 15. Back in the tiny Ontario village where they moved from, John had been a farmer. But there were more opportunities for him in New York, and now they were much closer to his other two children who lived in Rochester, his only son, David, and oldest daughter, Leah. Mr. and Mrs. Fox had high hopes for their move to America and attempted as best they could to transform their new house into a happy and inviting home for their little girls. But despite their efforts, no one in the family, not even them, could ever get truly comfortable in that little stone dwelling. The first problem was the cold. It was December in upstate New York, so some cold was certainly to be expected. But usually with a strong fire and wool blankets and some hot water, winter's icy grass could be banished from any home. But not from this one. No matter what they did, the house was perpetually populated with cold spots, random and bone chilling, that seemed to originate out of nothing. The second problem was that the house was loud. It creaked and groaned and sighed and croaked, speaking in the way that is customary of an old house, but with more volume than was to be expected. And this was an old, old house so it had much to say. The floorboards squeaked in protest of each step its inhabitants took, and the sound of water dripping monotonously like the ticking of a clock was heard faintly, but persistently, throughout every minute of every day. The ominous howl of the wind seemed to echo against the stone walls of the kitchen, and at night the weather was particularly hostile. The abrupt snapping and cracking of the dead branches in the yard resounded like distant rifle shots in every room of the house. The eerie din of the house irked and frightened young Margareta and Kate, but their parents knew there was nothing to be scared of. The sounds, though irritating and strangely loud, were completely natural and absolutely normal. Well, they weren't complete. Well, they were completely natural and absolutely normal until they weren't. Before their first week in Heightsville was over, the Fox sisters began to notice something odd buried within the cacophony of sounds their new home emitted: tapping not the occasional thud of things that have fallen onto the floor or the indiscriminate pitter-patter of rain on the roof or the sporadic beat of someone running up the stairs, but the deliberate, metered sound of someone tapping their fingers, tapping them along the walls, along the ceiling, across the floor. At first, the sound was faint, just barely discernible amongst all the other noise that permeated the fox home. But with each passing day, it grew louder and louder, like the invisible force behind it was growing more and more impatient. Night after night, the sisters would lay awake in their beds, blankets pulled up to just under their chins, holding their breath, trying desperately not to cry, waiting for the noise to return, waiting for whatever entity was behind it, an entity they felt was coming for them. Whenever the noise was about to come, the very atmosphere of Margareta and Kate's bedroom would mutate. It became congested with a palpable, oppressive sickness, like an infectious fog, like all the air had been sucked out of the room and the oxygen would be wrenched from their lungs. And only then... Would they hear it? Tap, tap, tap. Tap, tap, tap. Tap, tap, tap. Tap, tap, tap. Tap, tap. Tap, 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 tap. The sound was continually transitory. It would move around the room like someone was walking along the walls, wrapping their fingers methodically along the wood as they did so, circling the girls like a predator surrounding his prey. The worst was when the sound would come from the spot on the wall just above where their heads rested on their pillows 
like the thing was looming directly over them, watching them, waiting for them, just like they waited for it. It seemed to want their attention. It was screaming for them in the only way it could, and it brought with it such cold. Sometimes the tapping would emanate from somewhere on the ceiling or the floor, sometimes from the farthest corner of the room, sometimes from directly under their beds. But it was always close enough for the girls to feel the cold radiating from its invisible body, if indeed whatever this thing was had a body. Margaret and Kate were quick to tell their parents about the sounds that plagued their bedroom each night, and they begged them for help. And as most parents would, at first, Mr. and Mrs. Fox believed the taps their daughters claimed to hear were nothing more than nightmares, or the fanciful delusions produced by the anxiety of moving to a brand new home. However, they were quickly proven wrong. Before long, Mr. and Mrs. Fox began to hear the sound too. The tapping had grown louder now, occasionally sounding less like a tap and more like a closed fist banging on the walls. And it was also no longer confined to the girl's bedroom, and it no longer only occurred at night. The methodic noise resonated throughout the entire house and advanced into the day now. Unlike their daughters, though, Mr. and Mrs. Fox were confident the sound had a rational explanation. Rats or other critters clamoring in places unseen, an issue with the house's foundation or infrastructure, or some strange auditory illusion caused by the sound of their own footsteps or other movements refracting off of the walls. But after almost a month of investigating, they still could not figure out what the origin of the tapping was. Eventually, after ruling everything else out, Mr. Fox began to think that perhaps there was some intruder or deviant hooligan playing tricks on his family, somehow sneaking onto his property and slithering into his home to produce the haunting trill, perhaps with sticks or rocks or some other material. Mr. Fox enlisted a few close relations to help him catch the prankster, for he intended to punish the rogue severely for the distress and anxiety he was causing. Cousins and uncles began visiting the Fox household, volunteering to sleep in the living room so they might keep an eye out for the interloper and apprehend him for his crimes. Between December of 1848 and February of 1849, at least eight different people spent the night at the Fox house. Not a single one of them ever saw the thing that wrapped its long fingers on the walls, but they all heard it. Of the eight visitors, two of them vowed to never return to the cursed house, and one of them was so terrified by the sounds that assailed him in the dark that he fled from the house in the dead of night. The other five did continue visiting the Fox family, but always departed before the sun went down. Though Mrs. Fox, Margareta, Kate, and their sister Leah, who lived in a town nearby, now believed that the source of the disturbances was not of this world, Mr. Fox, a devout Methodist and staunch opponent of paranormal superstition, maintained that there must be a reasonable, natural explanation for it all. He just still had to find it. At his wit's end, Mr. Fox entreated the services of the Newark constables, essentially police officers, and the city watch. Every single patrolman that came to the house heard the uncanny, bone-chilling tapping that seemed to travel over the floors, then up the walls, then across the ceiling, moving about the house with calculated, measured direction, as if demonstrating its own autonomy. And every single patrolman departed the house bewildered and confused, unable to offer Mr. Fox any insight into what could possibly be happening to his home, to his family. As her father continued denying what was right in front of him, little Kate Fox, at just 12 years old, had begun to accept it. Since that very first night, Kate had known there was a ghost in the house. At first it terrified her, the creeping unseen force that rattled its way about her house. But as the months wore on, she grew accustomed to the spirit's unsettling presence, and though she was still wary of the entity, she no longer jumped every time she heard it knock upon her walls. Unbeknownst to her parents, Kate decided to give the ghost a name, and what an ominous name it was, Mr. Splitfoot. For hundreds of years, the word Splitfoot had been used, or has been used, in various ways and dialects to describe the devil, specifically in reference to the Antichrist cloven hooves. However, at the time the foxes were alive, the phrase was exceptionally rare, and not at all a part of the American lexicon. Whether Kate heard the term from someone who happened to know it, or somehow came up with it herself, sources do not say. What we do know, however, however is that Splitfoot meant the same thing to her as it did to the people of the Middle Ages. Satan himself. On the evening of March 31st, 1848, Kate and her sister were tucking themselves into the makeshift bed they'd assembled in their parents' room. They'd long since given up sleeping alone at night. All four members of the Fox family were exhausted. None had gotten a full night of sleep in almost four months now. At this point, over the course of a single night, the knocking would become so powerful and so violent that their heavy wooden bed frames would jolt with the reverb of the sound. 
On this particular evening, the family decided to try to fall asleep before the sun went down in an attempt to circumvent the inevitable tumult that would assault them in the dark. But evil, it seems, while perhaps more comfortable with the dark, is not necessarily afraid of the light. With the orange light of the late afternoon still streaming in through the small bedroom window, Mrs. Fox began reciting the evening prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in... Her strong, faithful voice was abruptly cut off by the faint din of someone steadily and slowly wrapping their fingertips on the other side of the bedroom door. Oh no, Lord, please no, Margareta whimpered. Already there were hot tears streaming down her ruddy cheeks. Next to her, Kate was sitting straight up in her bed, staring coolly at the door, her eyes alert and her jaw clenched tight. Mrs. Fox looked upon her children helplessly. She began stuttering something, though she didn't know what. Perhaps the next line of the evening prayer, perhaps a curse for the thing on the other side of the door. But before she could get a full word out, her husband proclaimed, No! No more! His face contorted with rage. Mr. Fox shot out of bed, charged at the door, and wrenched it open with such force it made his wife and daughters flinch. The room fell deadly silent. The tapping stopped. No one spoke. The only sound was that of Mr. Fox's ragged, heavy breath, like his lungs were overburdened with an unbridled anger that nothing and no one could subdue. They all just stared at the empty hallway. There was no one there. An uneasy silence was finally broken when Margareta couldn't hold her terror in any longer. Agonizing, guttural sobs burst from her, piercing the air like shards of glass. Mrs. Fox pulled herself out of bed to go comfort her daughter, but only made it halfway across the room before abruptly freezing mid-step. The old woman stood stoke, stood so completely still, so completely motionless, it looked like she was suspended in time. Only her eyes, unnaturally wide with panic, moved. Her pupils darted back and forth across the room. She was looking for something. She looked as if she was waiting for something. Alarmed by her mother's bizarre behavior, Margareta had stopped crying. Quietly, she murmured, Ma? Mrs. Fox met her daughter's gaze with a manic look in her eyes that somehow scared Margarita more than the ghost. Then she slowly brought her finger to her lips. Shh! The woman stuttered. Listen. Mr. Fox suddenly appeared in front of his wife and put his hand sternly on her shoulders. My love, what is it? Listen. They did. Mr. Fox assumed he was meant to be listening for more tapping, but that's not what he heard. Catherine. Catherine read the raspy, hoarse voice. It was as if someone was speaking directly into his left ear, with her mouth open, almost pressed against his skin. Yet it also felt impossibly far away, like someone was speaking to him from the past, a cavernous mass of forgotten years standing between them. The voice was that of erosion, of disintegration, of gravel and dust and sand. Mr. Fox knew in his bones that the voice did not belong to something human, but he didn't want to accept that reality yet. The speaker was fleshless, and it was speaking the name of his precious daughter, his little Katie. What did it want with her? How did it know her name? Pa, huh? what is it? Said Kate from the corner of the room. Before her dad could answer, someone or something else did. Bang! The singular thunderous sound came from everywhere at once, the walls, the ceiling, the floor. It was like a cannon had been fired inside the room. While the rest of her family stood petrified and mute like stone effigies in a crypt, 12-year-old Kate spoke into the descending darkness. Mr. Splitfoot, if you can hear me, do as I do. Then she clapped three times. Immediately, her challenge was answered by something unseen. Knock, knock, knock. Against the wall on the farthest side of the room, where nobody was standing, where nobody was even close, three succinct knocks resounded. To the shock of her parents, the next person brave enough to speak was Margareta. Though she was still frightened, her little sister's boldness incited something in her. Staring straight ahead and breathing heavily, Margareta slowly lifted her arms from under the blankets and stretched them out before her. She unclenched her white-knuckled fists and extended her shaking fingers, her palms to the sky as if to receive a blessing. Then she softly uttered, Mr. Mr. Splitfoot, if you can hear me, do as I do. Count to five. Margareta struck her hands together five times. Each clap was met with a simultaneous knock on the wall. Whatever the unseen intelligence was that was producing the knocks, that had been producing them for approximately four months now, was coordinating with the little girl's movement so precisely, so exactly, that it was almost violating to witness. It was like the entity could not only see her hands, but it could read her mind. 
After the fifth strike, Margareta looked up to see both her parents looming over her bed. Their faces were twisted with emotions she didn't recognize nor understand. Next to her, Kate appeared as expressionless as she had been all evening. It was unsettling to see a 12-year-old maintain such a sober composure in the face of such an otherworldly and incomprehensible thing, a thing that she had christened with the nickname of the devil. Margareta looked down on her open palms for a moment, then wrenched her hands back to her chest as if she'd touched a boiling hot stove. Weakly, she mumbled, I, I know what it is. Tomorrow is the day of the April Fool. This is someone trying to fool us. No one was convinced by the young teenager's claim, not even her. They'd all seen too much, felt too much, heard too much. Ignoring her sister's desperate attempt to explain the unexplainable, Kate said, Ma, now you, ask Mr. Splitfoot a question. Her voice trembled slightly as she made the request. Though she didn't appear panic-stricken as her sister, her friend Mr. Splitfoot was beginning to frighten Kate more and more. Dread like she had never felt before was crawling up her spine, making her veins run cold and her heart ache. Was this her fault? What she had done? Since the beginning, she'd known that Mr. Splitfoot wanted to tell her something. She didn't know how or when or what or why, but she knew it was inevitable. One day, he would speak to her from the dark, faraway place he lived, and his message would be hers for safekeeping. But now little Kate was starting to think maybe she didn't want to be Mr. Splitfoot's messenger. What if she didn't like what he had to say? Still, she persisted and again urged her mother to speak to the ghost. Somehow, Mrs. Fox did muster the courage to speak to the thing her daughter called Splitfoot. According to a letter she wrote 11 days after the incident, this is what happened next. I thought I could put a test to it, that no one in the place, not even John, could answer. I asked the noise to wrap my different children's ages, successively in order of their birth. Instantly, each one of my children's ages were given correctly, pausing between them sufficiently long to individualize them until the seventh, at which a longer pause was made, and then three more emphatic raps were given, corresponding to the age of the little one that died at the age of three, which was my youngest child. I then asked, Is this a human being that answers my questions so correctly? There was no rap. I asked, Is it a spirit? If it is, make two raps. Two sounds were given as soon as the request was made. I then said, if it is an injured spirit, make two raps, which were instantly made, causing the house to tremble. I asked, were you injured in this house? And the answer was given as before. Will you continue to rap if I call my neighbors so that they may hear it too? The answer was loud in the affirmative. My husband went and called in Mrs. Redfield, our nearest neighbor. She is a very candid woman. The girls were sitting up in bed, clinging to each other, and now trembling with terror. I think I was as calm as I am now. Mrs. Redfield came immediately, this was about half past seven, thinking she would have a laugh at the children. But when she saw them pale with fright and nearly speechless, she was amazed, and believed there was something more serious than she had supposed. I asked Mr. Splitfoot a few questions for her, and was answered as before. He told her age exactly. She then called her husband, and the same questions were answered. Like his wife, Mr. Redfield was astonished by the phenomena and could offer no earthly explanation for it. However, he was not yet willing to blame the supernatural as he firmly did not believe in such things. He beseeched Mr. and Mrs. Fox to call upon some additional neighbors and known men of science and intellect to come and witness the phenomena for themselves in hopes that together they could unmask the source of the knocks. And they agreed. It was decided that before additional persons were welcomed into their haunted home, Kate and Margaret should be taken somewhere far away partly because their parents didn't want to scare them anymore, and partly because they wanted to rule out the possibility that somehow they were making the sounds. Mrs. Fox took the girls to her sister Leah's house in Rochester, where they remained for many weeks. Once the children were fair, or far, far away from the house, the investigation began. That night, between 18 and 24 people visited the Fox house to convene with the ghost, which Mr. Redfield ardently refused to refer to as such. Most stayed at the house for an hour or two, questioning the spirit about secret and personal things, or testing theories about where the knocks were coming from and how. A few visitors, however, lost, lasted only a minute inside the haunted cottage, just long enough to hear the entity correctly convey their age or how many children they had or how many rooms were in their house through knocks. A few others, including the Redfields, remained with an increasingly agitated Mr. Fox throughout the entirety of the mystifying night. When the sun rose on April 1st, 1848, Mr. Fox and his unofficial committee of paranormal investigators had created a system to communicate with Mr. Splitfoot beyond simply yes or no questions. 
It was a time-consuming process, but one that yielded extraordinary results. To begin, Mr. Fox would pose a question to the spirit. Then he would slowly recite the alphabet aloud. As he did, Mrs. Redfield took note of each time a tap was heard and what letter it was heard on. By repeating the alphabet over and over, entire words and a few short phrases were spelled out. Unbeknownst to Mr. Fox and his company, they had just invented the world's first iteration of the Ouija board. An apparatus that has since then granted the demonic, the divine, and the dead alike direct access to the realm of the living, which is exactly what they did for Splitfoot on that night. By the time the sun rose, this is what the group had learned from their ghost, or at least, this is what their ghost told them. He was young when he died, around 30 or 31. He had been murdered in the east bedroom of that very house, but he had never lived there. He was visiting the cottage for work. After welcoming him inside, the owner of the house sliced open his throat. His body, he believed, was buried in the cellar. No one ever found it, and his murderer was never brought to justice. Mr. Fox spent the rest of the day destroying the cellar. He cleared it of all its contents, ripping up the flooring, and dug and dug and dug deep into the ground below. For hours he dug, but never found anything. He was forced to quit when he finally reached an underground pool of water and, and was unable to dig further. In a written statement for the local law enforcement, which had once again been notified of some strange happenings at the Fox Cottage in Hydesville, Mr. Fox wrote, I have heard the above statements of my wife and hereby I certify that the same is true in all its particulars. I have heard the same rapping which she has spoken of in answer to the questions as stated by her. There have been a great many questions besides those asked and answered in the same way. Some have been asked a great many times and they've always received the same answers. There has never been contradiction whatsoever. I do not know of any way to account for those noises, as being caused by any natural means. We have searched every nook and corner in and about the house at different times as to ascertain, if possible, whether anything or anybody was secreted there that could make the noise, and have not been able to find anything which would or could explain the mystery. It has caused a great deal of trouble and anxiety. Countless persons have visited the house, so that it is impossible for us for us to attend to our daily occupations, and I hope that, whether caused by natural or supernatural means, it will be ascertained soon. The digging in the cellar will be resumed as soon as the water settles, and then it can be ascertained whether there are any indications of a body ever having been buried there, and if there are, I shall have no doubt, but that it is of supernatural origin, signed John D. Fox. As promised that summer, Mr. Fox continued his search below the cellar, along with the four close friends who had witnessed the phenomena themselves. It had been six months since that fateful evening Kate Fox called out to Splitfoot by name, and since then the inexplicable noise had continued to occur in the house, though much less frequently, and never as violently or loudly as it had before. During that period, the Fox sisters eventually did return to their cottage in Hydesville, but whenever little Katie started spending too much time speaking with Mr. Splitfoot, she was sent back to live with her sister Leah. That was until strange and disturbing things began to happen in Leah's home whenever Kate was around. But that's a story for another time. For now, all you need to know is that on a summer day in 1848, five feet below the cellar, three, uh, excuse me, the men's shovels hit a large wooden plank. And below it, buried deep in the sediment and charcoal and dirt and much and the muck, they discovered a human skull and chunks of tangled human hair. And that was not their only discovery. A few weeks prior, a friend of Mr. Fox's had been going through some county documents and he came across a report of a peddler who went missing in 1842. He was last seen going door to door selling his wares in a small neighborhood in Hydesville, the same neighborhood the Foxes would move into five years later. Despite the evidence, many of those who heard the story still believed that the Foxes had made the whole thing up, the mysterious wrappings, the ghosts they convened with, and the discovery of the skull. The naysayers supposed all of it was contrived lies or delusion it wasn't for another half century not until 1904 that some of the claims made by the foxes and the 50 plus documented witnesses were proven true on november 23rd 1904 the boston journal a public newspaper with no affiliations to the spiritualist movement published the following the skeleton of the man supposed to have caused the rapping first heard by the fox sisters in 1848 has been found inside the walls of the house once occupied by the sisters and clears them from the only shadow of doubt concerning their sincerity in the discovery of spirit communication. The Fox sisters declared they learned to communicate with the spirit of a man and that he told them he had been murdered and buried in the cellar. Repeated excavations had failed to locate the body 
and thus given proof positive of their story. The discovery of the skeleton was made by school children playing in the cellar of the building in Hydesville known as the Spook House, where the Fox sisters once heard the wonderful rappings. William H. Hyde, a reputable citizen of Clyde, who owns the house, made an investigation and found an almost entire human skeleton between the earth and the crumbling cellar walls, undoubtedly that of the wandering peddler, who, it was claimed, was murdered in the east room of the house, and whose body parts were once hidden in the cellar. The finding of the bones corroborates a sworn statement by Margaret Fox and her husband John Fox on April 11, 1848. This discovery settles the question forever and proves conclusively that there was a crime committed in the house and that this crime was indicated by psychic means. Today, you can actually visit what remains of the haunted house of Margareta and Kate Fox in what is now Hydesville Memorial Park in Newark. It's a modest and visually unremarkable historic landmark that, upon first glance, betrays no indication of the terrifying paranormal events that once took place there over 175 years ago. A casual passerby would never know the significance of the crumbling ruins, lest it be for a single stone plaque standing in front of the visitor's entrance. The small monument resembles a gravestone, but no bodies are buried beneath it. And although it bears the names of the dead, it is not to commemorate their death, but to celebrate their vanquishing of it. The gravestone reads, The birthplace of modern spiritualism. Upon this site stood the Hydesville Cottage, the home of the Fox sisters through whose mediumship communication with the spirit world was established, March 31st, 1848. There is no death. There are no dead. That's an awesome story. Isn't that a fun one? That's really, really, really cool. Yeah, I thought so too. I really, really liked uh, how it was all put together. Yeah, no, it's beautifully told, and I had never heard that story. Yeah, you know, I had... I had looked into the Fox Sisters, I believed, on some episode of Scared to, or of a, <laughs> uh, Time Suck. You you are on Scared to Death. <laughs> I'm so scared to, of Time Suck a long time ago, but but just really like briefly, just kind of like touched on them, glanced on them. So I was, I was familiar with it. I knew that there were skeptics. I didn't know all these details, and, and I, uh, yeah, I really like how this was put together. Yeah, and and actually, I think it would make a really cool episode of Time Suck. Mm, to focus on, like, yeah, the spiritualism. Yeah, yeah, the Victorian spiritualism and just, mm-hmm. you know, the the root. Yeah, and then of, how, how it moved on from that, and yeah, yeah, it's really an interesting movement, too. Yeah, no, the whole thing was really fascinating, and at the end, when it all kind of comes together, it did definitely bring me back to Teresita Bassa. Yeah. Where I was like, yep. Like, people Uh who have been murdered that no one knew that they were missing or no one could figure, you know, unsolved murders. That's what I'm looking for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My brain is not firing tonight. Um, Unsolved murders. I'm like, here we go again. Yeah. Or rather, when Teresita Boss's case came about, here we go again. Yep, yep. Not so much this, but just... That that's a great story. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I, I also I also enjoyed reading it before I told it. Um, I, I got a bunch of pictures. Unless you unless you want to ask more questions. No, first. no. There's really. Uh, well, well, I guess the only question I would really have is: yeah. Do we really believe? Is is this really thought to be the beginning of the Ouija board? Uh, yeah. This this was like the origin story of the movement that ended up like later producing the Ouija board when people now started to try to like communicate with spirits yeah and they made these spirit boards that evolved into like the ouija board um but yeah i don't think i don't think that there was anything like that before this story this seems to be the first story of someone like like leading to like seances and really leading to like interacting with the dead i mean there's previous you know hauntings where people think they see a spirit Mm -hmm. but there was never like from what we can tell a concerted effort like this yeah over a long period of time to communicate with a spirit that did in fact seem to communicate back. And again, skeptics will say it was a hoax, but if this happened the way it happened, then this does seem to be the first documented uh, instance, at least in modern times, of over an extended period, someone you know figuring out a way to communicate with a spirit. Yeah, when you were explaining, you know, like the A, B, you know, uh-huh. and then like they would, that Mr. Splitfoot would tap... Right to indicate a, a letter. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, I thought, like, man, that must have taken hours. Oh yeah, <laughs> such a long, long process. Yeah, totally. and then in my brain, for just a second, I got really hung up on like double letters. I was like, what if, what if he's trying to spell the word hammer and he needs two M's? Do you have to yeah. start all the way over at A again? <laughs> and I always think with that kind of stuff, it's like, 
who says that they're a good speller? Oh my gosh. Right. Right. Just because they're dead doesn't mean that they can spell for shit. My gosh, that's such a funny concept to consider. Uh, <laughs> or, that they have a, or that they have a good memory. Because I, I, I noticed that one spot where he's like, oh, you know, 30 or 31. And for a second, I'm like, wait a minute. And I'm like, well, people actually didn't always know with certainty their birth year back then. True. And if they're like kind of forgetful, like, I don't know, I, I think I was 30, uh, and 31 maybe when I died. If they do age math the way I do. Like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Ag- aggressively rounding up, uh-huh. which Dan is convinced I'm the only person who does that. Uh-huh. Not true, but, uh, you know, he might have been 30, he might have been 32. Who knows? Depends on what kind of birth math he's doing. (laughs) Let's see those photos. Okay, so this first one, this is a picture of Margareta Catherine slash Kate and their older sister Leah from 1852. So there is the sisters, the Fox sisters. Okay, they're foxy. Foxy Fox sisters. You get it. Um, This picture is just an example of Victorian spiritualists, uh, a seance conducted by medium John Beatty. Okay. So just, uh, I do, you know what I find fascinating? I, I really was enjoying looking at these old pictures. Mm-hmm. What I like about people trying to, who are just curious about this stuff, you know, going back to like the spiritualism, early, early spiritualist days of the movement or whatever. Um, it's like, uh, you see these pictures of all these like serious looking people wearing uh-huh. suits, all like dressed up. And I, and I know just from studying other things, you know, there'd be like significant people of industry that were really trying to contact their, you know, dead loved ones, whatever. Or just curious about the other side. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I love that it brings out this like innocent curiosity amongst, you know, people of all ages, like just the paranormal in general, where if like, you know, if we were trying to hold a seance right now, I would immediately start to feel like I felt when I was 10. Oh, yeah. Like a giddy excitement. Yeah. Just a giddy excitement and just this exploration of the unknown when you're a child. So much of the known world is unknown. Uh huh. And there's that sense of wonder and awe. Uh huh. And I, I see that in these pictures, these people just feeling that. And it, it is really cool. Uh huh. Um, this next one is a, uh, another example of a seance conducted uh, by a, a fraudulent medium. What is happening? 1928. Here? Oh, they have um, that lady there blindfolded and, you know, walking her through all these things. And they're telling her that, like, oh, some entity is near her. And they just have, like, <laughs> people in costumes, essentially. Okay. I was like, pretending that's to be the ghosts. creepy. And, and there were, you know, to, to be fair, like Harry Houdini was actually, and actually, maybe that's where I talked about the Fox sisters in a Harry Houdini episode of Times. Like, he was big on. Uh, showing these people to be frauds, to be hucksters, and taking advantage of people with, in grief, trying to contact a dead son or a dead father, sure. taking their money. And he did expose a lot of them for being total frauds. But like we say here often, but maybe not lately, it just takes one to be right. Um, this is an old book, uh, The Spiritualist Handbook, How to Speak with the Dead. This is a 1918 edition. That's cool. Uh, this next one, a, a example of a, an illuminated seance conducted by alleged clairvoyant, Eric Jan uh, Hanusen, just, uh, he was a, a pretty big uh, psychic, supposed psychic in Germany around the, like, w- years leading up to World War II and during World War II. You could take this photo and show it to me and tell me so many different captions about what it is, and I would I know. believe you. You could tell me it's a seance. You could tell me it's a bunch of people, uh, like, at a wine tasting. Yeah. You could tell me that these are a bunch of bankers. Like, this is such a ridiculous photo. Yeah, it's an it's odd just, photo. Uh, to see these photos, you can visit our Instagram or Facebook at scared to death podcast. Uh, and if you're listening on Patreon, they're posted there in the uh, episode description, Yeah, but it's like a circular ring light with the medium man standing in the middle of it. And Uh then a group of people around the edge and they all have their fingertips on what looks like a giant ring light, but it, Again, the formality of it, uh-huh. people are in tuxedos and everyone looks well put together. I think we have this misconception now or this uh, stereotype that we assign to mediums and whatnot where they, you know, wear long flowy clothes and they look a little unkempt and they wear a lot of jewelry. This is the, like, could not be more opposite to that. Yeah, the, the previous kind of uh, trope or whatever of how those people present themselves was to be very, very well-dressed. I, mean, I think we should go back to that. <laughs> uh, this next picture, the Fox family home, 1916. Oh, okay. I don't know what I was expecting, but That's this house. very basic structure. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and then this is that uh, uh, tombstone-like plaque I talked about at this uh, at park. The Fox sisters plaque, you know, there is no death. There are, there are uh, no dead. Yeah. It's a very cool presentation there. Yeah. 
And then this one is a uh, people using a Ouija board, an illustration of uh, a man and woman using a Ouija board on the Saturday Evening Post of 1920 on the cover. They and, just look like they're having a good old time. Yeah. And then uh, this one is the world's first actual Ouija board from 1890. Wow. Okay, well, let me tell you guys, they haven't changed. Yeah, just a, just a little more simple presentation of it. Um, and then I, a little fun fact about the Ouija board for, before we move on. Uh, the Ouija board named itself medium Helen Nosworthy, created the board based on some early spiritualist iterations. And the first thing she asked of it, or the spirit on the other side, was uh, when she finished, was what it should be called. And the board spelled out O-U-I-J-A. So that's where Ouija comes from. Okay, there you have it. Yeah. All right, then. Well, that was fun. That was fun. Okay, yeah. good. Uh, are you ready to leave New York for Wyoming now? Oh, I mean, I do love New York, but take take it away. A uh, bit of historical setup before we dive into paranormal claims here. The Francis E. Warren Air Force Base, uh, located three miles west of Cheyenne, Wyoming, is one of three strategic missile bases in the U.S., but its first incarnation came long before the advent of the missile. It was first established back in 1867 by the Army and was originally named Fort David Allen Russell after a Civil War Brigadier General. And why was it built at all? Five years earlier, President Abraham Lincoln and Congress had made plans for the uh, Transcontinental Railroad. These plans included a military installation on the eastern slope of the Rocky Mountains in the Wyoming Territory to protect Union Pacific Railroad, Railroad workers from conflicts with local tribes. On July 4, 1867, the Union Pacific Railroad established its mountain region headquarters at Crow Creek Crossing, which is now Cheyenne, Wyoming. A few weeks later, the U.S. Cavalry uh, moved from their temporary headquarters in Cheyenne to a point three miles west to establish the fort. What started off as a frontier infantry and cavalry post eventually turned into a modern strategic missile facility. In 1930, the name of the base was changed to Francis E. Warren, named after a Wyoming senator and governor. The base then came under the control of the Air Force shortly after the Air Force itself was formed as a separate branch of the military in 1947, and its usage would then be determined by the Cold War. Today, Warren Air Force Base is part of the Air Force Global Strike Command and has an estimated 150 nuclear missiles ready for use at any time. It's also the oldest continuously active military installation within the Air Force. And because of its long history, it's probably not a surprise that Warren Air Force Base is said to be extremely haunted perhaps one of the most haunted places in all of Wyoming. Time now for the tale of the ghosts of Warren Air Force Base. According to the base's website, there have been reports of the paranormal going back to when the base first opened. Many have claimed to see the ghosts of cavalrymen in full dress around the base since the base's first few years of existence. Jill Pope wrote a book about these spirits and many others titled Haunted Warren Air Force Base. As recently as 2014, Jill was the director of the Cheyenne Street Railway Trolleys, part of her position as director of operations with Visit Cheyenne. The trolley tour started in 1988 and Warren Air Force Base was included in the daily tour until 9-11. The original trolley guides were not seeking out ghost stories, but when they spoke to base residents during daily tours and asked about the history of their homes, they quickly built up a collection of paranormal tales. Tour guides Valerie Martin and her father Bob Morgan were fascinated by the stories and decided to document them. And the best of these stories ended up being included in Pope's book. And in that book, many of the people who shared their stories said that they didn't believe in the paranormal until they encountered it for themselves at Warren Air Force Base. Some encountered the supernatural in Building 34. Building 34 was home to the base hospital and morgue before it became the security forces headquarters. And the most commonly encountered spirit there is a female apparition believed to be the ghost of a former nurse spotted walking from room to room, seemingly still checking in on patients. But the most haunted building is a brick house called Quarters 80, dedicated for officers and their families. It has been nicknamed Gus Quarters, named after the spirit that allegedly haunts it. When the Air Force Base was, a new, uh, was newer, a resident officer came home early and found an airman named Gus with his wife in an upstairs bedroom. Uh-oh. Gus tried to escape from the second story window, and when he jumped... It didn't work out well for him. He accidentally hanged himself on a clothesline. No! Since his death, residents of Quarters 80 have claimed that Gus has moved objects around the house, opened cabinets, even rearranged the furniture. In 1999, a family living in Quarters 80 told trolley tour guide Valerie Martin that they actually saw Gus's apparition. 
Several years later, Martin met a new resident of Quarters 80 at a Halloween event. She too claimed she had seen Gus. She said she encountered him in the primary bedroom. She described him as a tall, thin young man with curly red hair and a sheepish grin. She saw him when she opened her closet door. She was so shocked that she slammed the door shut, and when she reopened it, he was gone. Sounds like Gus might not have been done with his woman-chasing ways. One evening, another resident of Quarters 80 named Darren went downstairs and saw that his office light had been left on, even though he was sure he had turned it off. When he entered the room, he saw a man in vintage military attire sitting at his desk. He was initially astonished that a stranger would make himself so comfortable in his home. But upon further inspection, he realized the man was semi-transparent and therefore not a living man at all. And at that moment, he realized that the apparition vanished. Gus again, perhaps? Maybe Gus would have stayed longer if the person who encountered him had been named Darlene or Diana instead of Darren. The most disturbing ghost uh, stories originate from the family campground area at Warren, where some cavalry soldiers reportedly raped and murdered a young native woman at White Crow Creek. And for over a century now, there have been reports of a young woman's screams heard piercing the night air, waking up airmen in nearby dorms. The scream sounds so real, and the woman sounds like she is in such pain and distress that there have been several instances where the military police have been called to respond to the screams. And some officers have reportedly continued to hear the screams once they've arrived at the scene. Officers search and search and search, but they can never find a woman in distress. Sometimes these screams occur intermittently for hours at a time. Some have said that when they think they are close to finding her, the direction of the screams shifts farther and farther away. It seems as if no one has ever been able to actually spot her. Author Jill Pope spoke to a military officer named Randy who knew of an MP who responded to a report of a woman screaming on base. Randy said the MP was a serious, no-nonsense person who was not inclined to believe in ghosts. But after responding to that call, he seemed shaken, and he refused to describe exactly what had happened. He would only say he knew it was something paranormal. Finally, a few years ago, radio host Glenn Woods published a fictional ghost story on the website for KGAB, a local news and radio station in Cheyenne. And after reading the story, listeners began to send in their own uh, stories, but allegedly true ghost stories, much like our listeners do. The following story comes from a listener named Justin Huntley. Hey, Glenn. Really enjoyed your ghost story this morning. I worked at F.E. Warren Air Force Base, or yeah, F.E. Warren AFB, uh, as the base housing facility manager, and I've heard several stories of strange encounters from residents living in the historic brick homes on Fort Warren Ave, including from the current 20th Air Force Major General. I've never really given any of those stories any real credibility, as most often such things can be explained very easily, especially when you have an engineering background and over 20 years of experience in construction and maintaining buildings. That is until one Saturday afternoon in August, not two months ago. I had come in that Saturday to catch up on some administrative work and was sitting at my desk, which is located in one of the oldest structures on the base. An old brick horse stable, originally built for the 10th Cavalry Division of the U.S. Army, back when they were still fighting the advancement of the Sioux Indians into northern Wyoming, Crow, and Arapaho territories. I was working on my computer when I heard heavy boot steps walking from the front of the building toward the back on the second floor in what is now plywood floored attic storage space. I immediately assumed it was my on-call maintenance tech and thought he was up there looking for a part. As the footsteps progressed towards the back of the building, I got up and walked out to the shop area at the back of the building where the only set of stairs leading up to the attic were located. I stood in the middle of the shop, listening to the footsteps progress to the top of the stairs, expecting to see my on-call tech start walking down them. The footsteps then stopped at the top of the stairs, but my tech never came down. I called out his name, received no answer. I walked to the stairwell and ascended into the attic space and called his name again. No answer. I then walked all the way to the front of the attic, which is an open area full of spare doors and cabinets and plumbing fixtures and furnaces, searching for my tech who I was sure was screwing with me at this point. Nothing. No answer. No one there. No additional sounds. Then the lights turned off. This was odd because all the lights in the attic are on a motion sensor, with a timer that turns them off after 10 minutes of inactivity. I then remembered that the lights had been on when I ascended the stairs. Well, I thought that's not too unusual. Electronic motion sensors go bad. They malfunction all the time, especially when you buy cheap ones from Home Depot or Lowe's. I walked back to the stairwell, went back down to the shop, assuming I just missed my tech and thinking I'd find him out in the parking lot loading his truck or something. I went outside, found his truck in the lot, parked where it always is, locked up and no technician in sight. So I called him. He answered on the second ring and I asked him where he was. I'm home working in my yard. 
Did I miss a call from the emergency services or something? Uh, no, but I thought you were here. I heard you in the attic a minute ago. He asked me to describe what I'd heard. After hearing my explanation, he said to me, Look, boss, this has never happened to me, but you should talk to Bob, Janine, Mike, Daryl, and David. Every one of them has experienced the exact same thing you're describing. I said, you've got to be shitting me. And he replied, no, I'm not, boss. Over the last year, I've heard them all talk about experiencing that same thing. Since Bob has been here the longest, I asked him first thing on Monday. Before I even got the details out, he said, let me guess. You heard Boots walking in the attic, went to see who it was, found nobody there, and the lights kept going on and off. That was a pretty good summary, so I let it stand. He then hollered out to the team area for Daryl. Daryl comes in and Bob said, tell Justin what you heard the weekend you were on call and you came in to get the gas valve out of my office. Daryl then described exactly what had happened to me two days before, right down to the precise details. I'm a practical and logical man, Glenn. I'm an engineer by trade and I believe in empirical data over all else. There's not one single explanation I can come up with using the laws of physics, thermodynamics, or 20 plus years of learning building quirks that can explain what I and four other people have experienced here. And that to the stories and sometimes complaints we get from various residents in a few specific homes throughout the base, consider their wide variety of backgrounds, rank, home states, cultural differences, and different career fields, and it becomes pretty difficult to deny that something, at least unexplainable, if not supernatural, is at work here. Yeeky, yeeky. I like those little ones sometimes. That last story that the uh, the guy uh, wrote into Glenn about. Yeah. That guy, I'm looking up his Justin. name. Justin. Yeah, just, uh It reminded me of my very silly little thing at the Rainbow uh, Room uh-huh. uh, on Sunset Boulevard. You yeah. know, where it's like, it's not a big thing, but it just leaves you scratching your head and you're like, how, I don't know how else to explain it. In a lot of ways, I like the smaller things uh-huh. because the larger, grandiose, over the top, mm-hmm. it's like, <sighs> Are you just telling me a tall tale? I know you, it's, it's easier is, to be more skeptical. Yeah, you know, was the fish two feet long or was it 20 feet long? You yeah, know, yeah, yeah. it's like every time you tell the tale, it gets a little bit bigger. Uh, so yeah, I happen to really like those. And if you're going to have an experience, yeah. I, I have said this, you know, a gajillion times over now, but I think that that's the kind, well, I don't know, today. Today, I feel like yeah. that's the kind of experience I want. Something that other people have had, something that is not threatening. I'm yeah. not super scared, but I am definitely like, oh, don't care for that. But it's, yeah. it's at my work. It's not happening at home. Um, so you can kind of brush it off as well. Mm-hmm. You know, you can lean into it or not. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I agree. The rearranged furniture. Oh, uh, the Gus. Yeah. That was cracking me up. Just the thought of, just imagine this. You and I go out of town for the weekend. Uh huh. We come home. And the dog sitter has left. Yeah. So just Penny and Dee Dee just hanging out at home. Yeah. And we come home and like, let's just say our couch is in a totally different spot. Yeah. Step one, calling house sitter. Like, hey, did something sure. like, right? Did something spill or break or whatever? And then when she's like, what now? I lose my mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I thought you could go even like more extreme where it's like. No, I don't want to take it too far. You go to bed. Nope. Wake up the next morning, it's all moved around. That is that is definitely worse, and I don't need that thought in my brain. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I have two pictures. Do you want to see them? Okay. Okay, this first one, just a picture of the base. I mean, it does look pretty haunted. Yeah, no, I mean, that's pretty spooky. I'm surprised there's not more horror stories coming out of it. Yeah, definitely. And this next one is a picture of Quarters 80, a.k.a. Gus Quarters. And I mean, it does look spooky. Uh, I can't believe they let people still live there. Yeah, it doesn't, I mean, definitely doesn't look safe. I couldn't find any good pictures. So, <laughs> Y'all, he showed me some BS. What was that? What the was first that? One, The first one is a picture. I, I just Googled old haunted vampire castle and it was a poster you can buy on Amazon. Yeah, it looked like Disney. Yeah, totally. And the second one is just a dilapidated farmhouse that came up when I searched for horror movie haunted house. Oh, yeah. I mean, this second house is so dilapidated <laughs> that... It does look scary. How exactly is that front porch... N- standing still like Uh the awning is supported by nothing yep and it definitely has that vibe of like at any second something is going to pop out of one of those windows yeah that is like the perfect haunted house yeah quintessential as they say 
Okay. Who are they when they say they? Who, who are they? Oh, you know what they say? Mm-hmm. Who, who are floats they? around. There's different groups of they. Oh, okay, cool. And um, now before we move on to your stories, I know you wanted to mention the giving tree. Yes. Okay, guys, we're doing a sneaky mid-show announcement. Because yeah. I get it. We When we have a few spare moments, we do listen to some other shows and- I get it. Announcements are rough. But yeah. when something's really important, yeah. we want to make sure that you don't skip past it and feel left out. So here we are, ending end of October. Mm-hmm. We're nearing November. The emails are already coming in about like, hey, the Giving Tree, my family could use help. Or, hey, how can we support the Giving Tree this year? So yeah. I wanted to let you know that you know, it is coming and we really appreciate you guys hanging tight through all the announcements this month. We hope that they've all been fun. Haunting Hooks, Meet Up at Scarywood, the live show. It's been really fun to dive into Spoopy Month. Um, And now we're excited to focus on the Giving Tree. And in a future episode, we will share with you when and where you can apply for assistance for your family, but that is not this announcement. This announcement is how our community can help us support other people in our community. Uh, And every year, you know, we want to help as many families as we possibly can. And the only way to do that is with your additional support. So this year, we're starting the Amazon gift card collection a little bit earlier to give people a little bit more time and so that we know what we're working with in order to know how many families we can help. Um, Our goal this year is to match what we had last year, which is right around $40,000 to spread uh, across our community and to those in need. So if you're able to give a little extra holiday support this season, please consider doing so by purchasing a digital Amazon gift card. And when you, you know, go to your Amazon account and you're buying it and it asks where you're sending it, the uh, the email address that you want to plug in there is givingtree2024. So givingtree2024 at badmagicproductions.com. And we're accepting gift cards now through November 21st. You can find all this information in today's episode description, which I recently heard people don't know where to find that. So when you're looking on Apple, Spotify, wherever, you know, iHeart, yeah. all the different places, you know, it'll say like the show name and then the episode name. And then you see like a bunch of words that explains what the episode is about. Yep. Generally, there's like a show more kind uh-huh. of button. Click that and all the information will be there. And if all of that was just too much, you can just email us and we'll tell you where to go. Yep, exactly. Okay, great. Thanks for bearing through yet again another announcement. For a very good cause. Yeah, yeah. We hope that you guys know that our announcements are nine times out of 10 us telling you cool things that we are doing that benefit our community. Yep. Great. And now it's time to get spoopy. Let's do it. Do you have a Layla over there? I do. I, I have forgot a... to ask you before we started. Oh, I do. I have a pile over here. Ooh, okay, great. I was nervous. <laughs> well, let's dive right into a voice in the woods. All right. Hello, Dan and Lindsay. Hello. I'm a longtime listener and fan of the show. Thanks. I've been listening to the show at my workplace from the beginning, and I've gone through the complete catalog about three times now. Yes. Since I upgraded my employment, yay, bioengineering, I've had a lot less time to savor every story, but I still love to listen when I can. Today, I would like to share with you a story that happened to me many years ago. I'm originally from California and grew up in the 80s to 2000s doing normal stuff LDS youth do at that time. We went to dances and youth activities, and like most young men at that time, I participated in the Boy Scouts. Camping, fishing, hiking, building, you name it. Part of those activities were the annual summer camp trips where we would leave for a week, sometimes a week and a half, and go to the Boy Scout summer camp. At the time, I was recently elected to become the senior patrol leader, meaning I was over all the other boys in our troop, making sure that they got to their classes, performed their assigned tasks each day, went to leadership leadership seminars, and so on. Among my many responsibilities, I was given one perk I enjoyed immensely. My tent was on a platform. It meant I didn't have to share with anyone else and I had a view of the enormous lake out of my window in the morning. Our troop campsite was far from the main camp. Everything was a walk to get to, but I didn't mind. I've always been someone who likes to quiet their mind in the woods. One night, I was fast asleep in my tent when I heard someone touching the fabric of my tent. 
It sounded like someone or something had tugged on the canvas tassels used for tying down the tent. I assumed it was an animal or a bear poking at the tent. And before you can say anything, we had lots of encounters with black bears in Northern California. Each and every time, they either only wanted to mess with you or to steal your food. Regardless, I brushed it off. But after some time, I heard it again, accompanied by a soft calling of my name. This intrigued me and I poked my head out expecting to see one of my friends wanting to go for a midnight stroll or something, but I saw nothing. I waited quietly looking around, but I was greeted by only the darkness. So I went back to bed, climbing back into my sleeping bag. As I lay there pondering, I heard it again, right outside my tent. I put on my pants and my shoes and I began to search for whomever was calling my name. I found myself walking with great curiosity down the trail, away from the camp, and towards the lake. The moon was high in the sky, illuminating everything. I didn't think to bring my flashlight with me as I walked down the path to the lake in a sleepy trance. The voice would call my name every few feet. It was like there was someone just a little ways ahead, like a friend calling to me to come and take a look at something. I don't know how long I was walking or what time of night it was. I only realized what was happening when my bare feet touched the water. Like a jolt to my brain, I realized I was shin deep in the dark water of the lake just off the rocky shore. My feet were sore, standing on rocky points in cold water. I ran back onto the shore, wondering what the heck happened and what was I doing there? And then I heard it again, much closer. It was as if someone was over the water calling to me, but of course I saw no one. I turned and began to walk quickly back to camp, confused and afraid. I hurried up the trail, my feet wet, sloshing on the ground, picking up dirts and rocks, stabbing me in the dark. Did I bring a flashlight? Why was I down at the lake? Why didn't I bring my shoes? And that was when I realized I had put on my shoes, but now they were nowhere to be found. Before I had a moment to contemplate this further, I heard a more forceful voice call to me, much louder, almost shouting at me, coming from the direction of the lake. I did not look back. I began to run up the trail, and as I ran, the voice grew angrier and angrier. By the time I reached the campsite, I heard it violently yelling my full name, something not even my closest friends even know. I jumped inside my tent, tied the canvas door shut, and zipped my sleeping bag closed, stuffing myself into a ball as the voice screamed my name at the top of their lungs, and my tent shook. I awoke the next morning to the morning bugle, a common occurrence at Boy Scout camp. I told my friends and leaders what had happened the night before, but no one thought anything of it. They blamed it on nothing but a bad dream, and I was inclined to believe it myself, until... We all began to get ready to go for breakfast, and that's when I found my shoes outside my tent soaking wet. I do believe in a world beyond ours. I know that for most people, the veil is shrouded over by our perceptions, but sometimes there are moments when the veil is thin and entities or beings choose to communicate to us in ways we cannot possibly fully comprehend. Thank you for all the scares and the fascinating stories. Let me know if you want more. Your friend and creeper, Rob. Thanks, Rob. You bet, Dan. <laughs> oh, th- yeah. Th- I liked, um, for a second there, I-, I wrote down like in my little notes here, it was like a siren's call. Like the siren calling oh, like, like something into the water. That's uh, smart. Uh-huh. And then, um, but yeah, that, that was a good little detail at the end about like the shoes being wet outside where it wasn't just uh-huh. a dream, unless it was like a sleepwalking, lucid kind of, you know, like weird dream, I guess that way. But that's pretty intense. That'd be terrifying uh, to, okay, paranormal or sleepwalking to to snap out of it, snap out of your trance, uh, spell, wake up, whatever, and you're in the water. In the water. That's, that's so scary that when you first stepped in the water, you didn't be like, ah, just immediately panic. Uh-huh. Because then, then I would then I would just think I'm like, well, what happens next time? That's right. Yeah, if I don't snap out of the trance until I'm underwater. Uh huh. It made oh me my think God, of that. That's a nightmare. And in the dark in a lake. Uh huh. And no one knows where you are, and you didn't bring a uh, flashlight. 
it made me think of Yellow Jackets, that TV show Ooh, that we love. Yes, I know. I wish the new season was out. Oh, God, I know. That show is so good. Guys, Yellow Jackets does not sponsor this show. We just talk about it a lot because it's know. so good. And it's annoying how long it goes between seasons. I know, I know. That's the way production works, my friend. Yeah. Um, but there is like a very specific scene in a lake and someone is like, yeah. yeah. Something happens. I can't tell you. It'll yep. ruin everything. But, oh, man. Just, yeah, like you said, the idea of just waking up mid-action of anything that could cause your demise is yeah. terrifying. Yeah. Whether that's like you wake up and you're driving your car down a road. Mm -hmm. You know, you wake up and you're about to dive into your own pool or just like whatever. Anything yeah. that is immediately very scary because it could cause you a lot of harm is terrifying. Yes. Yeah. Oh, uh, when you mentioned a show, another show that's not sponsoring this, but I, I just like to throw out recommendations. Yes. I, I'm way behind on this one. It came out several years ago and it came out, it's a sci-fi original and I'm normally not a big fan of sci-fi original programming. Yeah. But it's called Channel Zero and season one, pretty good, like very creative. Th there was, you know, some uh, acting that I was, I was like, okay, this isn't the best acting, but like really inventive. Yeah. Pretty good on Rotten Tomatoes. I noticed that uh, after I watched it, I was like, oh, okay, you know, it seems to get good ratings. Season two, so far, I'm just a couple episodes in, really, really creepy. Okay. And just, and also very imaginative and unique. It's, you know, it gets hard to find things that are really unique and, and different with so much content having been made over the years and still being made. So yeah, that's another recommendation is Channel Zero. Did we talk about Speak No Evil? I think we did. Oh man, so good. I that's still think about it. That's a great thriller. That's a great thriller. Yeah. Okay. Well, before we go off the deep end, okay. would you like to hop back into one more story? I would love to. Okay. Listen closely because the details of this story are important. All right. All right. Let's go to the sleepover. Hello. I'm a longtime listener who's feeling awkward trying to make small talk with people I've never met. Mm -hmm. Many weird things have happened to me growing up, but this, this one takes the cake. So get your shield blankets, your comfy socks, and your Layla squishy ready. <laughs> this is the tale of the sleepover. Age-wise, my aunt, sister, and cousins were all within a few years or two of each other. Then, six years later, I came along. I was forever trying to hang out with them and be a part of their group, always being told I was too young or, my favorite, that babies aren't allowed to do whatever stupid activity they were interested in at the time. They would get their way most of the time, leaving me crying in the lap of the closest adult screaming, it's not fair. Most of the time, that is, unless I ran crying to our mom. I would beg and flash her puppy dog eyes until she would sigh and make them include me in their shenanigans. One Friday when I was nine, we were visiting my grandma's house. Mary, my aunt, and my sister Pat were excitedly chattering about having a sleepover. Mary's friend Lisa was on her way and my sister had just been given permission to stay over. They were planning what scary movies to watch, what kind of pizza to fix, when I declared loudly that I wanted to stay too. Sorry, squirt, my sister said, using the only name she would call me with mock sorrow in her voice. This is just for us. No kids allowed. Running to my mom, I cried and told her I wanted to stay more than anything. Batting my eyelashes, I told her this could even be my birthday present. No was my mom's forceful reply, and that's final. But it wasn't. <laughs> Smiling, I waved as I watched mom drive away. We had a great night watching movies, eating popcorn, and dancing like crazy. As the night was winding to a close, we all crept to my aunt's room to tell ghost stories. Her room was upstairs. No, not like on the second floor upstairs, but like in a creepy attic dormer turned bedroom. Her room consisted of two full-sized beds separated by a small window. Nothing else was in the room as she often slept downstairs. As it started to storm, we dimmed the lights and took turns trying to scare the others with our stories. Lisa got up, taking a few steps to the other bed when she froze. You, uh, you, uh, you, you guys, there's someone outside. We laughed, thinking she was just trying to work us up. As she turned to stare out the window, we knew she wasn't lying. We all rushed to the glass, scanning the yard for any sign of an intruder. There, next to the tree, at the end of the driveway, stood a lady, tall with dark hair, wearing what looked like to me a long white wedding dress. 
She had her back to us and seemed to be staring at the road. The thunder boomed, making us all jump. But none of us could turn our eyes away from the lady in white. Mary, 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 I whispered, tugging on her teddy bear nightshirt to get her attention. If the storm is so bad, why is her hair not moving? The wind is blowing so hard we can hear it whistling, and the trees look like they could snap. Ugh, we know that squirt. My sister rolled her eyes as they all shifted and stared at me, giving me the get to the point kind of look. Okay, we know that, I repeated, but her hair, her hair and dress are not moving. Not at all, not blowing around, like like she has a shield or something. And just as the truth of my observation hit them all, there was a loud pop and the lights went out and we all screamed. And then somebody said, oh, she's gone. And we turned back to the window to look as a bolt of lightning lit up the sky and the woman's face filled the window. She was right there outside the window, the upstairs window. Screaming bloody murder, we started hopping around, waving our hands like that was going to save us somehow. With a quick flicker, the lights came back on and she was gone, just like that. We glanced this way and that, checking to see where she went, but there was no sign that anyone had ever been there. We all huddled on one bed, breathing and trying to calm each other down. But that wasn't about to happen because the bed started to shake. As the shaking grew worse, the bed began to bounce a few inches off the floor. Screw this, my aunt yelled as she leapt the shortest distance from one bed to the other. We followed her lead, the bed shaking harder as each, is, as each of us left it. As the last of us made the jump, the bed bounced one last time, then stopped, and all was quiet. The next weekend, we were back at Grandma's. As normal, Mary and Pat were whispering on the couch. What you talking about? Oh no, Squirt, this is way too scary for you. I scoffed and glared at her hard. After last weekend, nothing can scare me. Mary's face went a little pale as she raised her eyebrows and asked, Oh yeah? What happened to you last weekend? The same thing that happened to you, I said. Her color came back and relief filled her fetchers as she decided I was just messing with her. I don't think anything as remotely scary as what happened to us happened to you. Shaking my head, I said, it was the same thing. We all saw the same lady. Stillness fell over the pair as my sister looked me straight in the eyes and with a shaky voice asked, uh, what lady? Taking a step closer to keep the adults from hearing me, I said, the lady in white. My sister grabbed my arm and pulled me to her, shaking me. Who told you? Let go of me, I said. No one told me. I was here. God, let go. You went home with mom last weekend. Remember, she said she wouldn't let you stay. That's not true. I was here. I began recounting everything we did that night. What we watched, what we ate, the fact that Pat and Lisa had on the same nightgown, you know, the one with the fuzzy gray cat in the middle of it that Grandma had given everyone last Christmas. I told them how Lisa made four scrunchies from New Kid on the Block fabric and gave me one because I cried when Pat ate all of the strawberry ice cream knowing it was my favorite. Then I told them what happened after Lisa saw the lady in the window. Mary looked like she was going to be sick as she slid her hand to my other shoulder. Squirt? You weren't here. Stop it, I said. I'm going to tell mom on you. You're trying to scare me by pretending I wasn't here. <laughs> oh, yes, Anna. Go ask mom if she let you stay. You know she wouldn't lie to you. My sister never called me by my name. I think her using my name scared me more than anything as, my, as I made my way to our mom. My talk with my mom revealed I was absolutely not at that sleepover. She had said no, and her no was final. We went home, had soup, watched Masterpiece Theater, and went to bed. I was never, ever there. I was never there to eat pizza, never there to watch The Exorcist. I was never there to see the dance we made up to when doves cry. I was never there to see that wrinkled face stare at us through the upstairs window. I was never there to feel the bed shake and bounce beneath us as we jumped to what we prayed was safety. I was never there. So how did I get that fourth scrunchie? Lisa did make four scrunchies that night, but swears she never gave me one. And how did I know everything that went on that night in such perfect detail. 
And why? Sometimes, when I close my eyes all these years later, can I still clearly see the face of the lady in white, Anna. That's a weird one. That is like sleepover nightmare 101. If I'm like a teenage girl listening to this show, this is potentially my worst nightmare. Like your little sister wants to stay at the sleepover. Your Uh mom says no, but then somehow she's there. Right. From her point of view. Yeah. and, And telling you everything you did but was actually never there when your mom confirms that said little sister went home with her. Yeah, because that, that story was going to be creepy outside of that detail of her not being there. Like, just like the the lady, like her, the, sure. you know, the hair not moving in the wind, everything. I'm like, oh, yeah, it's just a spooky story. Yeah. But then you add, like, she wasn't there. I'm like, what what the hell? Yeah, what kind of, like, doppelganger? And, and which is the doppelganger? Is the little girl that went home with mom, is that the real girl? Or is that, the do- is that a doppelganger girl? Who, who well, no, was at the sleepover? I wouldn't think it would be a doppelganger because no one saw her at the sleepover. So they weren't seeing her. They, they, were, they were saying, we, we weren't there. It's more like astral projection. Oh, you're right. Like something like that. Nobody at the sleepover knew that she was there. I should know this. I astral project every night, <laughs> as I just recently found uh-huh. out at an oh, oracle boy. reading. But I mean, but I mean, that would be the par- the paranormal, you know, um, explanation. La- yeah, explanation that, that I would go to out of that out of that. Oh uh, yeah, I don't know. Like you know how sometimes you're in it and you're trying to justify it to yourself yeah. and understand it. In my mind. It was doppelganger situation. Oh my God. I don't know how I completely like astral projection, pun intended, flew right over my head. <laughs> uh, yeah. Like it's something almost, that, yeah, like her, her essence was there, but invisible to the group. And it's like something like, like, and, and astral projection would supposedly be, you know, if that thing is, if that's a thing, you know, when you're dreamy or when you're asleep. Yeah. And essentially is like your soul leaving your body. People believe in like these different planes of existence and different mm-hmm, frequencies, mm-hmm. It's kind of like new agey stuff. But that, like, you know, while you're sleeping, that you, your essence, your soul, whatever can go other places and then come back. And then there's the risk of like, but when you're gone, what yeah. if something else comes into you? Um, but this, I, I don't know what other phenomena that I've heard of would, would explain this. Cause that's just so, that's so weird. It's so weird. If I'm her sister, I am so freaked out by my little sister now. Yeah, because I was trying to think. I was trying to think. Like, did her sister come back and just talk about every detail of the sleepover, and then she just regurgitated it? But it doesn't sound like that happened. No, especially because of the age difference. It's like it's not like they're bonding over. Yeah. Like, oh, you missed the best sleepover. Wish you could have been there. Right. Her, her sister is consistently trying to carve the little sister out of things. So the last yeah. thing she's going to do is come home. And tell her everything that happened. And she supposedly took something home from the sleepover too. That and it, that doesn't line up with astral projection, though, because you're not like a physical. From what I understand, from what I can remember, you're you're not a physical being somewhere else. Right. Your physical being in this plane is home. It's in your bed, wherever, and you're just the spirit out there floating around. So I don't know how you would bring something home. That's just everything about that. That's weird. It, it's really unsettling. It is unsettling. Yeah, it's been bothering me. For days. Yeah. Just thinking about it. I'm like, but how How did that happen? What kind of glitch in the matrix is that? <laughs> right, right. You know, like that is bizarro. Yeah. So anybody yeah. listening, if you if you have thoughts, we'd love to hear it. Uh, I actually emailed with um, Anna about this because the way that something was written, she had to like, she like misspoke. And I was yeah. like, wait, what? I'm like, I don't understand. Like, I just needed a little bit of clarity. And she's like, oh gosh, sorry. You know, and I was like. Yeah, yeah. Um, but there was no like further explanation of like, well, I th- I think this is what happened. Like she was like, I you know, she just doesn't know. Yeah, glitch glitch in the matrix um, <laughs> kind of works too, where you know there's these people who believe that like there are well, it's the multiverse, infinite amount of possibility. It's like that movie oh we saw. What everything is awesome. Everything everywhere all at once. Yeah, yeah. I was thinking of the Lego movie for a second. There, I was like, everything, everything is, is awesome. awesome when you're part uh, of a team. Everything everywhere all at once. Yeah. Where it's like there's this um, theory or whatever that every single time there's a choice in your life, you choose choice A, but then there's another you that goes with choice B. It's kind of like choose your own adventure books. Yep. And it's like an endless branching off. We're just constantly branching and morphing. And there's all these parallel realities that are very similar. Some of them are very similar. Some of them wildly different because they're built on bigger, different choices. Yeah. And this feels like 
she went somehow into the parallel universe where she was allowed to go in the sleepover. Mm -hmm. But that's not the universe where her parents and sisters that she has always grown up with actually live. Yeah. It's all kind of heady and confusing, but yeah. It's very cool. I know I've mentioned this book multiple times, but The Midnight Library yeah. is like a very approachable way to kind of play with the multiverse in, uh, a, yeah. in a like very light way and more like retrospective of like the choices we make. But this woman, she goes into this library and it's all the books of her life and you yeah. can pull any book off the shelf and jump into different versions of your life. Yeah. And it's exploring that idea of like, if I make choice A, then this happens. If I make yeah. choice B, then this happens. And um, I read it late last year and it, I don't know, it gave me a lot of peace about being right where I'm supposed to be. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, but it's just a, a fictional, just a fun, easy yeah. story. Matt Haig. Nice. He just put out a new book as well. Do you want to thank some of our Annabelles? I do, Dan. Thanks so much for asking. Yeah. Um. Well, you know what's... No, really... I'll, I'll start. I'll start. Yeah, because you know what's really strange, Dan? Huh. huh? They're missing from my script. Oh, no. That is quite bizarre. You know what? I'll, I'll thank some Annabelles. Do you want to go grab you, them while I'm thanking them? Uh, you know what? It's okay. We're just going to roll with it, and next week I'll just do more. There we go. Could, because the spoopy shout-outs are here. Yeah. We're just... Okay, well, I guess, listen, the universe just didn't want me to do it. All right. <laughs> uh, I will thank the following Annabelles, Daniel Brock, Anthony Ali Anthony Alessio, uh, Michaela Kenyon, or Kenyon, the Salty Hippie, <laughs> <laughs> Brandon Ibach, Spooky Shadow Cats, Brent, Rachel Ray, Just Ray, and Emily Schultz. Now, Rachel Emily, Emily Schultz, no T. Rachel Ray, like the chef? R-A-E. So no. Oh. Okay. Well, I'm not disappointed. No. How many times in your life does oh Rachel, God. I cannot even like imagine. People are like, <laughs> oh my God, are you? And you're just like, no. No. Sorry to disappoint you. Different Rachel Ray. I hope you're a really good cook or baker or something in that space. Where I forgot about Rachel Ray. Yeah. She I was know. wildly popular. Wildly popular. I also really like the salty hippie. Oh yeah. That's a good little I feel moniker. like I would be friends with that person. Do you want to do some spooky shout outs? I do, Dan. Thanks for asking. To Katie from Mom and Dad, happy birthday to our as close to Halloween as we could have gotten, baby. <laughs> it shows in your personality and love for all things spoopy and your sixth sense. We hope your birthday is extra special. Nice. To Brittany, a badass bitch from Mommy's Little Creepers, Aiden, Booger, Xander, <laughs> Xanderbutt, and Malachi Boo Boo, a big happy birthday, Mommy. It's pretty cute. She uh -huh. she wrote it herself because yeah. she was like, no one's going to get this. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I'm just going to do it how I want it to be done. I love it. To Allison from Chaston, you are the strongest person I know. We will get through this hard time together. Oh. To Tyler, my favorite spud from B, thank you for a wonderful few days at our mini camp reunion. You are the best friend anyone could ask for. Sorry about the giant mosquitoes. I love the camp friendships. Uh -huh, anybody, me too. Anybody who has Crazy. the ability to do camp, I cannot tell you, like, please join the Wet Hot Bad Magic Summer Camp Facebook group. Learn all about summer camp. Marriages, babies, engagements, Ridiculous. best friends. It is, it, I, it's the craziest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> it is. Uh, to Eric, my person, from your we one and wife, Nicole. I love you endlessly. You go above and beyond for everyone. You're such a hard worker and an amazing man. These past seven years have been amazing. I can't wait to see how our relationship progresses. Me and the fur babies love you endlessly. To Lannon, my amazing fiance from Haley, your wife-to-be, I look forward to every day that I have with you and I can't wait to spend the rest of my life with you. And lastly, to Daniel from Leslie, happy birthday. You are the most wonderful husband and you will be the best dad when our baby arrives. That is adorable. And that is our show. Uh, thank you for continuing to send your personal tales of terror to my story at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. You can email us for everything else at info at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. Uh, thank you to Logan Keith scoring today's show. Thank you to Heather Rylander organizing the My Story emails. Uh, thank you to book editor Drew Atana polishing and preparing listener stories for book number six. Thank you to Molly Box for assembling that first story I told this week. Well done, Molly. Yeah. And to Olivia Lee for assembling the second. We are on Facebook and Instagram where we post pics that accompany episodes and more at Scared to Death Podcast. 
We also have a private Facebook group, Creeps and Peepers, full of fellow horror lovers. Uh, big thank you to the All Seen Eyes, the Creeps and Peepers moderators. And enjoy your nightmares, Creeps and Peepers. Hope you were scared to death. Bye. If spirits threaten me in this place, fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through but has no home here within scared to death. Mad Magic Productions. Oh god, it's orange. What are these orange gourds called? And it's it's kind of round. <laughs>